For an ancient Egyptian, there was quite a selection of wildlife on offer if you wanted to take on a pet, with monkeys, birds, even rather dangerous animals like leopards and crocodiles appearing to have been adopted. But just as we do today, the Egyptians had a strong preference for two animals in particular to share their homes with, cats and dogs. Both cats and dogs appear to have been named after their distinctive sounds. The word for dog we transliterate Iu iu, which proves, if nothing else does, that we're sorely missing the vowels of ancient Egyptian. A dog's bark is bachan, which is a wonderful coincidence of onomatopoeia. The cat is miu, but that reed is sometimes transcribed as an a instead, which would give us mau. My head canon is that a kitten was mew, and an adult cat is a deeper mau, but that's not based on anything other than the most profound wish of my heart. While a cat can be happily left to its own devices, a dog will tend to need more care. As a result, the ability to feed a dog meant having regular access to meat, and being able to spare some. Dogs were therefore associated with wealthier families. Like in the modern day, dogs were given a number of roles in society. The ancient Egyptians had guard dogs, hunting dogs, and police dogs. Several deities were canine, including most notably Anubis, whose species is still subject to debate. If he's meant to reflect a wild animal, the so-called jackal, that was likely an African wolf, then perhaps Anubis was designed to fight fire with fire, as scavenging wolves at grave sites must have been a recurring problem. If instead he's modelled after a domestic dog, perhaps it's little more than his loyalty to humans and ability to stand guard, docile one moment and at red alert the next, that qualifies him for his job overseeing the dead as they journey from one world to the other. Dogs seem by and large to have been considered part of the family. They were often named, which doesn't seem remarkable to us, but consider that by contrast cats in ancient Egypt often were not. When a dog died, it was mourned and buried with the full expectation of entering the afterlife. And the mourning was a formal one in a lot of cases, employing the same customs used to mourn a human. Cats, often considered purely aesthetic creatures by modern urban denizens, are actually extremely useful in an agrarian society. They range far and wide, centred on the home, and not only do they feed themselves, but they feed themselves on the pests that would threaten your crops or your pantry. They're also protective against more insidious pests like serpents, biting insects, and scorpions, which they often spot in intercept before human eyes do. This protective association is reflected in the existence of the goddess Mufdet, arguably the first Egyptian deity to be depicted as a cat, often a leopard later on. Her remit included protection from worldly things like snakes and scorpions, and as a somewhat logical extension of those things, she protected against curses, evil conspiracies, and the malicious thoughts of others. One imagines her divine paw swatting malevolence out of the air and namming it all up. The worship of cats is an idea we inherit from ancient Greek scholars, potentially misunderstanding the veneration of cats and the way certain gods were depicted, but it's fair to say they were well regarded. If dogs were thought of as members of the family, cats were perhaps thought of as apotropaic figures attached to a household. That makes it sound colder than it was, and without question the Egyptians were as fond of their cats as we are. Possibly not quite as fond as we are. It would be negligent of me not to speak of one of the earliest cat mummies we know of, belonging to a cat who was a favourite of Prince Thutmose, the eldest son of Amenhotep III. I think it's clear that a very young Prince Thutmose was presented with his cat when she was a kitten. Certainly, he seems to have named her in that rather on-the-nose way that very small children will tend to name things. For upon her beautiful limestone sarcophagus, she is named Tamiut. Somber and serious Egyptologists would translate this as she-cat, but I'm going to follow the example of author Barbara Mertz in preferring to translate Tamiut as the name Miss Kitten. We see Miss Kitty depicted upon her sarcophagus, a grand lady of the royal household, offered tribute which she ponders with great anticipation while wearing what is clearly some kind of elegant scarf or shawl. Upon her high-piled plate is a whole roast goose, which leads 
leads me to suppose, and I will never be proven wrong, that this refers to an instance in her life where the great lady took it upon herself to purloin a goose from the royal table and take it back to the kitchens for a feast of her own. Part of her funerary inscription reads, The Osiris Miss Kitty, true of voice before the great god, which can have no clear meaning except that she often meowed loudly at the pharaoh, I assume during important sessions of the royal court. I myself am placed among the imperishable ones that are in the sky, her inscription continues. I am Miss Kitty, the triumphant. And as her spirit tucks into fresh roasted goose in the field of reeds, while her ears are scratched by the young man she was a kitten with, who can deny her that title? As always, thank you so much for watching. The Egyptians had a really interesting relationship with the animals in their natural environment, and I want to talk about that more. I've got a video coming up in a few weeks that looks at another set of misconceptions we have about ancient Egypt, focusing on their religion, and we are going to talk about whether or not the ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. Thanks, as always, to my backers on patreon.com slash armchairegypt, who are superstars. And thank you to everyone who subscribes and watches and likes and comments. You are superstars also. Until next week, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.